Grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dudes and Beer Podcast. I am Chris Jordan, your host. Don't forget, the Dudes and Beer Podcast is brought to you by Audible. If you're a fan of books like I am and just do not have time to thumb a page anymore because you're out on the road doing what you do, living life, you can take those books on the road with you. Stop on by audibletrial.com forward slash dudes to get your 30-day free trial of Audible. Tons of books, tons of categories, uh, tons of genres. Go check it out. It is audibletrial.com forward slash dudes is the website that you want to go to to get your 30-day free trial of Audible. I am so happy to have our guests on this evening. Uh, Former WCW, WWE wrestler, uh, Psycho Sid Vicious Udy is joining us as well as Barry Norman, uh, both of them gentlemen with years and years in the entertainment industry, coming to you with the entertainment now known as the Vicious Circle Podcast. We will be talking about the creation of that show, how they came to their career in entertainment, and how this show is going to change things for both of them. Uh, When we come back from this quick report, from our in-house reporter, John Baum. Take it away, John. Yet another mass shooting immediately politicized by Beto O'Rourke, this time in Odessa in Midland, Texas, where seven were reported dead and as many as 21 injured. Like an ambulance chaser, if there is a mass shooting in Texas, you can guarantee Beto O'Rourke will be there to grab the national spotlight before all of the information is in and the families have had time to realize what happened, much less heal. Not sure how many gunmen, not sure how many people have been shot, don't know how many people have been killed, the condition of those who have survived, don't know what the motivation is, do not yet know the firearms that were used or how they acquired them. But we do know this is up. The Dallas Morning News reported that Frank Pomeroy, a pastor at the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs where a mass shooting took the lives of 26 people, including Pomeroy's daughter, revealed O'Rourke for what he is. Pomeroy said he was angered by the response of some politicians to the recent mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton. He specifically mentioned Beto O'Rourke, saying the former El Paso congressman and current presidential candidate politicized the event. Pomeroy said, rather than putting their political ideologies aside for a while, they turned people into political pawns. Those people need grace. They needed hands. They needed hugs. But that isn't stopping Beto. He is, of course, making the rounds on liberal mainstream media less than 36 hours after the shooting. So Texas, and, and a few, I'm not going to go through them all, but guns in church and in mosques and synagogues, having guns in, where you're worshiping. This is a, one that I found particularly frightening. House Bill 302 prevents landlords from restricting tenants and their guests from carrying firearms in lease agreements and prevents property owners association from banning storage of guns in rental properties. Well, for God's sakes, the people who are committing mass shootings, where do they think they store their guns? They're in their apartments. They're in their homes. So what you're saying is if I'm a, a responsible uh, land, you know, landlord, I can't say, you know, that guy that's got like 15 AR-15s that lives in my place, I can't kick that at him out. Yeah. I have to let him carry. Well, that doesn't sound like that's going to prevent mass shootings. A lot of this stuff sounds like, to be honest, to be blunt, it's make it easier for mass shooters. Absolutely, and and these are instruments of terror. Of course, what Beto and his liberal cohorts won't face is the fact that it is becoming obvious that the only recourse against this wave of mass shooters is to exercise our Second Amendment rights. And I knew every one of those shots represented someone, that it was aimed at someone, that they weren't just random shots more than likely. I grabbed a handful of ammunition and started loading my magazine. Uh, I ran outside, I didn't even take time to put my shoes on. And then I saw a man in a black tactical helmet with a sun, with a dark shaded 
helmet on and uh, obviously looked to me like it, it was bulletproof vest. And he had a pistol in his hand and we exchanged gunfire. The Democrats' gun-free zones have been the go-to hunting grounds for roughly 96% of mass shootings since 1998. All gun debating aside, why is it that we are led to believe that a wave of white nationalism is behind all of the mass shootings? Anybody can see that there are a variety of faces on this graphic of 2019 mass shooters. Not to mention that there was a mass shooting in Alabama between black folks the day before Odessa that was completely ignored by mainstream media. Mobile police say at least 10 teens were shot. I tried to protect as many as I possibly could. I told them to get down. Mobile police say all of those injured were teens, ranging in age from 15 to 18. Not to mention at least 20 of the mass shootings in 2019 have been in Chicago. This August, 288 people were shot and 46 people were killed. All of it ignored because it doesn't fit the liberal media's divide and conquer narrative. The only feasible reason for the dangerous pattern of propaganda unleashed on the American public is that the Democrats are fomenting a divide so deep that they will bring order out of chaos through a manufactured race war that no real American wants. John Bound reporting. Introducing the challenger. From West Memphis, Arkansas, weighing 313 pounds, Sideshow Spill! Psycho Sid got a pretty good fan base. Psycho Sid had a great fan base, y'all. Pretty good fan base. This is, of course, the audio from Psycho Sid's uh, intro to the ring against Shawn Michaels from the 1996 WWE Championship. Uh, please welcome to the show, everybody, uh, Psycho Sid Vicious. How are you doing this evening? Man, yeah, I'm doing good. How about yourself? Doing great. Uh, we also have with you tonight Barry Norman, uh, the gentleman who is helping you produce host uh and take care of this awesome vicious circle podcast that you guys are getting ready to launch here soon um before we get into that uh share with us sid uh we'll start with sid then we'll go into barry and kind of bounce back and forth but share with us sid how it was that uh you came into professional wrestling and entertainment to begin with i always love hearing people's root story i mean we all know uh, the famous things we all know, uh, of course, your career arc uh, through WCW, sure. WWE, things like that. But what was it that really like sparked it for you? For me, like here talking to like uh, Daredevil, uh, D Dr. Danger Carpenter here in my studio, just hearing people's stories of going into things like wrestling, boxing, <clears throat> extreme sports, stuff like sure. that fascinates me. So. What was what was your personal spark that started that journey for you? Well, it was just about like your typical Russian story. I was needing a uh, heroin fix instead of robbing a drugstore. I, I thought to get into professional wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> no, just yes. <laughs> no, the real story gets boring. No, no, really, what happened was uh, I was in this true story. I was. Uh, 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 pro football had started a league called the USFL, and, and Memphis had one of the teams that I tried out for the team and made it to the last cut. And uh, just the same time, I was working out in the gym with the uh, Randy Savage, uh, Tracy Smothers, Lenny Paulson, Hickory Gym at the time was called Holly Davidson. And um, they saw me one night at the Coliseum with this bogus promoter. Uh, he actually promoted a guy, a guy named Eddie Bond, who had his own little country. Um, youth uh, show here in Memphis and um, what he was he's trying to scam me to get a percentage of my money they said man if you ever thought about wrestling get rid of that guy we'll introduce you to the right people and, and then they introduced me to Tokyo Yamamoto which was the, um, the nearest training school for me and that was in Nashville 
And uh, then I started training, and that's how it sort of got started. Wow, yeah, such a and it always amazes me how uh, careers that have gone as long as yours did, things like that, that are still going. Um, how simple these stories start out, folks. Um, it's it's so often. Well, mine, was, uh, mine wasn't a mine wasn't a typical story like you know so many of these guys that they're you know they had family, brothers, fathers, grandfathers in this business, and yeah. So we got um, black grandfathers into the business. I was just the other. I was just um, I never really watched wrestling, and then um, met these guys in the gym and had a wife that was pregnant and looking for a job, just getting out of farming. Farming across the country had gotten bad at the time. I was, that's what I've been doing up to that point, just uh, pretty much just a sharecropper on a, on a person's property, just you know getting by, and then this all happened. Uh, it's sort of like one of those funny stories that you know, the country boys out there lifting you know, bags of fertilizer all day, and all of a sudden, one day this guy really got pretty big and then started being noticed by people, and then, if you sort of pass by the story to Randy Savage, got himself through wrestling just from hard work. Yeah, yeah, precisely. It's it's hard work, determination. You know, I mean, of course, there's a little bit of luck, like you're saying, being in the right place, the right time, being around the right, right being around the right people. Uh, I can, I can't express enough uh, what it is to surround yourself with the right people, regardless of your career or your chosen path in life. Um, surround yourself right. with the right people, folks, and things just tend to happen. Um, right now, it's funny, you know, I met Barry pretty much at the very beginning of my career, too, at WCW. I think I've been wrestling for about a year or so before that. And then me and Barry have been friends since that, uh, this whole time, just about. Yeah, yeah. And, and Barry's, also writing, Barry's also writing my book called Poetry in the Sand, which he's written his own book called um, The Flipping Point. It was about getting close to 60 and um, uh, being affected by ED and the uh, lack of internet, uh, you know, <laughs> girls with internet. Uh, so, but anyway, it was about that. It was about, you know, he's creative. But he just started selling. He just, got, he just dumped off on some dude up in Brunswick, Maine. The dude's actually looks to kill him right now for giving this bogus cinema. But uh, other than that, very pretty. Now, I'll tell you what they did to me recently. See, Barry thinks he's a, you know, everybody comes, the guy that he's texting me early says, man, Barry's such a good guy. I said, yeah, just don't meet him at a uh, rest stop by yourself, you know. And um, so um, we were talking, Barry, Barry calls me a couple months ago. He goes, and I'm one of these guys, that Barry knows this too, that, you know, he's texting me on the floor. He goes, he said, uh, throw the rock at the car. I said, well, sure, I'll throw the rock at the car. Well, he, he calls us, you know, I've got this idea. We're looking for a guy who go around and judge Barbecue contest, five thousand dollars a week. All we need is put you in using rentals that. So I got about about twenty, you know, about two hundred fifty dollars worth of different types of ribs and stuff. And I cook it. And just two months later, like sometime yesterday, it hit me. Why did Why did I do that? You know? Why did right? I do that? <laughs> yeah, I said. Oh, well, but again, uh, that's Barry for you. Now, Barry also is, uh, he'll tell you, I wouldn't even talk about himself. No, Barry, this is all joking aside. Barry's been around. He's uh, started so many film festivals. He's been set in Olympic committees and stuff like that. And Barry, seriously, for a minute, tell everybody about yourself and, and the writing and the, the movie that you did, that short film that ended up starring that really famous lady in Walking Dead. And uh, so I want people to know Barry as well. Yeah, Barry, absolutely. Tell, Thank you. Yourself. Okay. Please, Barry, go. Okay, yeah, man. Like the, the second film that I ever made was when I decided I was going to be a filmmaker and not take any real jobs, and I ran out of money and ended up taking a job as a bill collector. Like the worst job I ever did. I did it for one month, got absolutely nauseous doing it every day, and quit, and decided to make a film of it. And uh, this was actually um, no, after the, uh, WCW, so the first person I cast was uh, Mick Foley, and then the other one I cast was a local actress that I knew from taking some cinematography classes, and I cast her you know, as, as the co-lead. And this was in 1995, and that was Melissa McBride. Oh, wow. Is, and now, obviously, one of the, yeah, one of the stars of The Walking Dead, you know, she plays Carol. And every now, and so this, it actually got distributed. You know, this was only a 30 minute film, because that's all I had time to shoot three days and, and, and time to make. But Troma, you know, the uh, distribution company that does things like uh, you know, the Toxic Adventure, Surf Nazis Must Die, I mean, that, that type of stuff. 
they distributed it, and so it actually sold like ten or twenty thousand units. It was, it was on a compilation of the best of trauma, and they but they used my film Deadbeat you know, to sell it, and I got a check a, a check for two dollars and forty three cents, and they spelled my name wrong on the check. Uh, but since Melissa McBride became famous <laughs> no, no, a few years ago, every now and again when I'm bored, I'll check the internet, and there's like websites all over the place dedicated to it. And so it's been seen dedicated all over the world. Film? So, so yeah, I mean, because because of Melissa McBride. Yeah, because yeah, like, now so it's people a, see a famous actor as someone. Yeah, she's now a thing. This yeah, now it's a fan film. Young, now it's a fan film, and I understand oh, that the, okay. the bill collecting community is also, you know, it's like much viewing for them because how many films are made about bill collecting? Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it's, it's been seen <laughs> everywhere. I mean, every now and again, I'll see that it's been reviewed you know, in, in South Korea, Germany. I'm not making any money on it, but people are seeing it. So that's, that's me. I'm, I'm always the guy in deep covers, and I'm sure when you did this, know your, your intro, we have no, no Sid Vicious and Barry Norman. There's a, a collective who? <laughs> So why, 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 why do I care that he's on the show? Who is this guy? Well, Barry, 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 Barry also, now, uh, Barry also's got Kevin Nash that part in the Ninja Turtles uh, as a slasher or whatever that guy was. Street for Shredder. Street for Shredder. Now, Barry oh. worked at WCW from the beginning days with Jim Hurd. Tell him a little bit what you did for, in the beginning days with Jim Hurd and for WCW, Barry. Well, I, I, it was one of those things where I, I kind of fell into it. I've, I've always been an opportunist. I was actually working at, at Headline Sports, and there's no way to go up there. Everyone wanted to be the field producer, the guy that goes to the Super Bowl or the World Series. So the people that had that job wasn't going anywhere, so they actually advertised in-house. We have a job, uh, WCW public relations manager. And I said, well, wrestling is live events, pay-per-view events. Uh, uh, merchandising, all kinds of things. That might be interesting. So it turns out I was the only one that applied. Uh, so that's so why I got the job. And um, when I first got it, I, I didn't quite have my uh, Rolodex as developed. And a bit later, where I was able to get uh, you know, people like Kevin Nash uh, you know, uh, hired in a movie. And I got us on uh, Family Feud a few times. I got Penn Gillette, you know, Penn and Teller to write an article. So uh, this is actually how I met Sid. You know, or, um, the first thing people knew about me is I'm this 30, 31, 32 year old kid, you know, wearing a suit every day. Didn't work in wrestling, so everyone they wanted nothing to do with me. I mean, who could blame them? I mean, who who the hell am I? And so the first part, when I didn't have any uh, numbers, I couldn't do anything big. The only thing I tried to do was I'll promote the house shows in the small markets. You know, we have house shows where you have a, a syndicated show. That's part of the contract. So I would get you know, local radio stations to want to interview our guys. So they would see me coming with a little piece of paper that said, hey, and, 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 and in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, you had to wake up at 5, 3 in the morning and call this radio station. So the word came out, when you see this guy in a suit coming, waiting a piece of paper to run, because it's going to be some stupid thing you don't want to do. So Sid was a guy I kept on trying to, because he was one of our biggest stars, and I kept on trying to do stuff. And every time I, I went anywhere near him, he went the other way. I mean, who wouldn't? And I finally asked someone, I said, how do I get through to this guy? How, you know, what do I need to do to try to you know, bond with Sid? And they said, you know, do you play or know anything about softball? And I go, yeah, I play on the CN team. So they said, mention that. So Sid was having to do a promo for Halloween Havoc you know, with Elvira. And so I was there once again, I know my stupid little student, and I, I go up to him, hey, Sid, and he gives me that note, looks like, oh, God, him again. And I said, I, I, I hear you play softball. And I was like, yeah? And I said, you know, CNN has a softball team. The only thing that you know is required to play on is you have to be, you know, work for a, a Turner Broadcasting entity based in Atlanta, which of course it did. So took him to, you know, to a softball game, and then Sid will tell you, you know, the, the second half of the story. Uh, he went, you know, four for four uh, with four home runs, and he can tell you how how, uh, you know, how the fourth one happened. Three of them are still like orbiting Jupiter and Saturn, and this is the only game that I'll ever remember <laughs> what I did at the plate. Now, I went one for four. You know, I said, they're not even that 500 in focused softball. It's a pretty amazing feat, and, and, I, and I was able to do it. So the first two times Sid comes up, he blasts balls that are still traveling. I Not only did I make out, but weak pop-ups. You know, cans of corn to like the shortstop. And I'm, I'm not as big as he is, but I was you know, 6'5", 215. I should at least be able to you know, have warning track power. And so after, after he hit his third home run, I, I said, you know, let me use your bat. He goes, yeah, what are you using? You're using a toothpick. And, and uh, what did you have? So like 38 ounce, you know, 40 ounce bat or something? Something. Like, 38 ounce power cell. 
Yeah, that's right. So he, so he said, you can do this. He's got that little thing. So I actually, you know, hit the farthest home run I've ever hit in my life. And nice. then, of course, the fourth time I, I got, I popped up again. But I mean, they, you know, the team was just giving it to me for having these lame, you know, nothing hits. Well, Sid is doing these moonshots. The only thing I like about it was I was the one that brought him the team. And, and, and Sid can finish the story about how he actually hit that fourth home run. Well, what it is in a lot of leagues, even in uh, leagues I played in where A League teams, we, there's a designated amount of home runs, 10, whatever. And this is what happens in this league, there was a designated three home run rule. And then I think everything like that. So getting the fourth home run, I was able to do that. It was a, actually, it was a line drive against the fence. The guy it hit his glove, took his glove off, and went over the fence. Anyway, you saw I actually was able to get four home runs and even a, just a three run, three home run uh, limit. Wow. Now, I, I lobbied that they should have or they should have made that a single and a three run error, but it, it didn't work. It went in the push of the home run. So we were four for four for home run runs. I was one for four, but at least my home run was a good uh, was a pretty good shot. So I, I had that. Well, and I right. mean, just the way that you gentlemen talk about this, uh it's it's like there was an immediate bond formed uh over the plate. And it's it's great. Yeah, when... we started he started Go ahead. He started coming over to the house and we have cookouts and then me and Dave went you know, we did a lot of hanging out together. We went to a lot of softball uh, cages and played softball, you know, just hit a lot. And, and then, you know, went to lunch and, hang, you know, hung out on days off I had. If there was a day off that we could do a barbecue, he'd come over. My wife, we'd all cook barbecue and stuff like that. So, you know, we just kept friends over the time. And that's how it worked out to it. You know, I could sort of say, if not one of my best friends, my best friend. Wow. And and that's great. Yeah, you know. no, our, we, it, it, just, it just clicked. I mean, our, our sense of humor is quick, and for both of us, that's, that, that in itself is something. <laughs> not, not everyone gets our humor. And then to me, the most interesting thing was actually getting to know him and talking to him. And the thing I like about Sid the most is, you know, he basically defies expectations. It's so easy when you're his size and you work in wrestling and you're, and you're from the deep south to people to know to pigeonhole you. So decide, no, this is your, no, this is what your education is. This is how smart you are. This is, yeah. And he's, and that's not it. The, the most amazing thing about it is I always consider the sign of intelligence is people who ask you questions. And like when I owned my, my movie theater for nine years, as a friend, he was always concerned about me. He'd call me every, every day, how'd it go today? You know, how'd you do? How's business yeah. going? And then, and he was obviously interested as, as a friend. He wanted me to do well. And then he just started asking me more and more interesting questions about the business. Because obviously it's something, I mean, he goes to movies, he's in the entertainment industry. He would ask me more and more pointed questions about exactly how this happens, how it's run, how you get filmed, how you market them, what, what the time of the year, time of day, weather has anything to do with it. And I can tell you, after all the years of asking questions and listening, which is another hard thing that a lot of people don't do, he, he listened, you know, as, as I explained this to him. This could probably right now run you know, a, a small theater like I did because he listened so well and asked so many questions and understood what I was telling him, that he that he is smart enough that he could run a, a business that he probably never had interest or even thought of. And that's one of the things I like about him. He just has a, a level of intelligence that most people, like I said, haven't gotten the chance to know, and that's another thing I think is going to be really interesting about the podcast is people will say, okay, it's that it's a it's wrestling podcast. You know, he's going to say things that people aren't going to believe, and he's going to have you know, certain intuitions about things, and it doesn't even have to be about wrestling. You know, he can talk you know, to about anything, yeah. and once again, he'll ask questions and, and he'll learn stuff. So uh, he, he just, like I said, we became very you know best friends, and I just find him one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. Well, and well, and too, I I use Barry for everything. I hit Barry with school for history and all these things and writing and so, you know, we both share one thing for sure, and that's the love for music. And uh, we're always talking music. Uh, you know what's going on today. And there's you know, ten times library. I have the music, but we both share the passion for you know stereo equipment. And we we talk about those things and stuff like that. And um, but what he says, I think, makes a lot of it's going to really make sense in the future is that together with us, I think Barry makes me, and not I think, I know, Barry makes me a better person. And you, you said, or someone said to me, I think Steve Jordan said this as well, I think you said earlier in your show that we we'll surround you itself around, around good people, and that's what I've yeah. always believed in. Uh, because, you know, real successful people you know, have other, you know, good people around them. If they don't, then they're usually not successful. And that's why, actually, yep. when we heard that the WWE was taking um, 
applications for writers and writing teams, I wanted to test Barry to me because one, Barry does have an idea for the wrestling business because he was in WCW from the beginning to the end. And then he also has a really, uh, he's very educated in the writing, like, you know, the movie with the lady walking dead and all the film stuff and stuff like that. So together, me and Barry both think this, and I think it more great, but we'd make a really good team for WWE because one, we're hard, hard workers. And then, then you've got someone like me that knows the wrestling side of it. And, yeah. and it's really as simple. I, I can hold your hand. If you just listen to me, I can walk you right through it and I can make you as popular as you want it to be. And as, as long as Barry's helped me write the stuff, and let me concentrate on some of these other things. Me and Barry would be almost unstoppable uh, as writers in wrestling. And uh, that's one of the things we did put on, you know, we're letting everybody know that we did put a name in the hat there. And actually, I had uh, Scott Kirkpatrick, an attorney of mine, you know, uh, email it directly to a uh, guy named Scott England to try to hand it straight to someone because we felt like he was getting lost in the shuffle some more because Barry can explain that we, and we don't want to do There's a system when you get these resumes in by internet, how they could go right past you and never know who you are. So this yeah. way, at least they knew who we were. And I know Eric, you know, personally, we've always got along. And I thought that might be, you know, something down the line that he might want some help like that. Uh, because, you know, I think, you know, one thing about Eric, why he was, you know, successful other than being lucky with the NWO thing, he also knew his limitations. You know, he's got, you know, great people around him, you know, that helped out. There's no way he would ever admit that or say that he ever tried to do this by himself. So, you know, that's some another reason I wanted to go that route because, you know, maybe it gets straight to Eric and Eric, you know, says, you know, I need some help here. And I, I know I know Sid's a hard worker and I know he's honest. And I think he says Barry Norman's a good guy. You know, again, you go to his resume, seven Olympic committees and blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's, again, we're, you know, we had done that recently as well. Yeah, and you got you guys seem to make a great team. It's it's rare that um, you find people like well, y'all. Let me cut they, you off. Let me cut you off for a second. Let me just cut you. Go ahead. This is I'll tell you how you do it. Let me real quick. And this is to make a point because I like and this is things that I'm going. To, I'm always going to do. The point is this: we wrote a, about a seven page intro, which they wanted us because they asked us for our first chapter, and they wrote this thing it was about a kid playing wiffle ball. They called me and asked me, do you really think that much of yourself? So if you're intimidated or you know, that can intimidate you, talking about a kid playing with a ball with a, uh, you know, and that is really about what it was. That's what I'm saying. I know we have something off of them. If that's intimidating, think what if we could get in there for a whole week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, um, for somebody to say that, uh, you you gotta just kind of ask him like so so did you ever see me in the ring? Um, did 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 you ever see the way that I I taunted and preened my opponents? Uh, yeah, I think I'm that good. <laughs> well, no, this is the thing is that they I mean they already know that part. I, I, oh yeah, honest, I think I'm really as far as the wrestling side of it. I don't think there were many people that were any more successful than I was in. The, and I keep it real simple for people that don't know a lot about the business is that, again, if you look from the beginning of my career, even as Lord Humongous, you know, yeah. my very first match, I was main event with uh, Austin Nile and Nick Bockwinkle, Jerry Lawler. So I didn't have a run like oh, some of these guys, just a one-time run. My, my whole career was a run. Uh, now, you know, I'm not going to go about when it was successful or not successful, but again, I was on top most all the time. Yeah. So, and this is the thing is, I, I was just, I wasn't a fan of the business, but I was the biggest student. And I got to, again, be in the right place at the right time and meet some great people. I'll go back again. I'll mention one guy, Eddie Gilbert, who held my hand. And this is the thing is, when you learn something like simple things like, you know, get something a year, if you see how you really get something a year and that really works, you know that works. When the next time you try it, you get three months, it doesn't work. You go, okay, that's why it didn't work. And Eddie Gilbert was one of those people who told me things like that. He held my hand to be sure that I had the best chance to get over as a as a you know, as a singles wrestler, and what he did, he put me in the tag team with what Danny Spivey called the skyscrapers, and Danny, Danny Spivey sort of did the tutoring, tutoring from there. Meaning, okay, do this, do that. This is how you get heat. You know, this is how you get to the hotel. This is how, I, I didn't even have a credit for it, so I was you know having to get you know a ride everywhere. So again, without Eddie Gilbert put me in that place, holding my hand through that, and then when it starts getting to time to say get over. 
he would do things like this. He were, you know, a lot of brokers don't do this. And I'll give you an example where we were, me and Danny were working with the uh, Steiners a lot. And uh, Ken looked at me and says, Ted, I see you where you do these guys, you press them from the floor and throw them over the top rope. Or, yeah, he goes, do that to Rick and Scott tonight. <clears throat> now, Rick and Scott didn't want to do that. But when the boss says to do that, that's what you do. So, I mean, Eddie would enforce his deal to get people that he knows had a chance to get over. And you don't get over unless you get those kind of chances. And that's why I said earlier, I can hold your hand and listen to me. If you had just a little bit of a chance, I think it could help someone get over. Um, and now, can, what I'll ask my counterparts, you know, this, this, um, we won't throw names out there, but some of the names that just recently moved into the office of WWE. Who's even gotten over like that? Who can do what I just said? And who could come in with a guy like Barry to back up my writing skills and make them even better than they are? That's a tough deal to follow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, because you're, uh, it's a different world in wrestling. There, there is script and there isn't. Uh, there's some that's improv. Uh, there's an incredible amount of stunt ballet that happens live and even gets to the point of incredible, incredible personal injury. Uh, you yourself uh, suffered a major injury, uh, fracturing your leg, um, things like that in the ring. What does, what does that do? Uh, how do you, number one, how do you prepare yourself for that? And number two, how does that prepare you for other things uh, like taking on this project that you're taking on right now? Well, I, it goes back to my first interview where I, I clasped my lungs. I had to go in and cut away part of it and sew it up. And I came back from that. And that's a really tough one, too. And what it does when you have something like that, adversity, which I faced that from a childhood uh, with a mother and father named Bobby Joe and Mary Joe, that should say everything about what adversity I've had to face coming from the South. When you do face adversity like that, and then again, I'm just the type of person, I'm going to get myself up. I love a challenge. I really do. And uh, me and Barry both do. We, we, I love a challenge. So I just look at it as a challenge. You know, get yourself up, dust yourself off, and, and keep going where you're trying to get to. And, you know, I think I really did get where I was trying to get to. If you're not ready for adversity, if you're not if you're not ready uh, to to chase after something doggedly, is it something that you should really be chasing after? Um, and right. As as you guys have been working on the Vicious Circle podcast and getting things ready for that, uh, what has that process been like for you? Uh, the process of development, the process of, I guess, kind of. Uh, arcing out what what the podcast itself is about uh what have you begun to discover through that i always find it you know, thing, interesting working with people is, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go things. first because i have very, go ahead this is i'm gonna go first because i've got a short answer is that they i just got my first um actually my second uh flat screen phone which i'll tell you the story on my first one you know we were trying to write book and i was corresponding and this guy taught me how to get online i started <clears throat> <clears throat> arguing with another person online and Barry saw that. He said, Sarah, I want you to get rid of that phone right now, which I did. So now we're telling this for a second phone. Now that's why we're, we're sort of making up a joke about what Barry says, that's Internet Sid. That's the Sid that until you know, Barry was kind enough to educate me about all the wrong things I was doing in life. I actually, he told me a couple of years ago, Sid, Sid, you're actually growing up. And uh, I did. <laughs> but now with Internet Sid, we can't stop him from saying some things sometimes. <laughs> So, so that's what's going to be fun, too. But really, for me, I'm just learning about it. And I've always thought of keeping my vision in life wide. And um, I got, didn't get into the Internet and this side of the business because of the gossip stuff. And now I've learned how to prepare myself for gossip. And like Gary says, what you do is you just don't respond back. Because when you do, you extend the argument. So I'm not going to be extending the argument. You know, Barry, you tell me about how, how you got into it. Please. Well, I, I, I got into it because it was the one who came a, a, a while back that I think this is what I need to do, you know, to get back into. I mean, basically, it's reclaiming his brand. I mean, you know, Sid has been a major force in, in, in the wrestling business, and this kind of touches on what, what you and I were talking about before: how he how he gets pigeonholed and stereotyped. 
okay, he was a great star in the ring. He actually changed the face of wrestling. He probably was the first you know, uh, you know, heel to be, be considered a baby face uh, when it, it completely changed it from black and white. You're the heel, you're the baby face, where now everyone is cheering the heel. And look at right. television. It's not a show today, whether it's on Netflix or Hulu or, or AMC, in which it's all dark, where, every, where everyone is the heel because that's what people want to see. So yeah. as far as doing this, it was like, okay, I mean, reclaiming the brand of, of Sid, uh, where, where people know that he's still in the industry and is actually still beyond the industry. And this is how you try to hone what is going to be the mission of a podcast. We don't want it to be just, let's be controversial just for the sake of it. We can stir stuff up and badmouth people, and you know people are going to want to call and, and get into the argument and say, this person's horrible. What did this person do to you? And, and settle scores. And I said, I don't think that's what we want to do. I said, you, are, you have years and years and years of experience in every possible way about the industry. And once again, his knowledge goes beyond that, which is why he would be a great fighter producer for WWE or any wrestling promotion. And the hard thing is getting people to see him as that because they're still going to see him as Sid Vicious, you know, the, 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 the monster deal that goes into the ring and crushes people. Well, now we're talking about the intellect. The intellect would be able to look at wrestling or any topic because as you know, a podcast doesn't necessarily stay on topic if, yeah. if you have people calling in. It, it could gear, and how do you can you handle that in a way where it still becomes interesting? When you go completely off topic, how do you shape you know the conversation? And Sid is great at this. And once again, he can defy expectations. Where all of a sudden, if someone want, wants to talk politics and we've got wrestling at all, it can go in that direction. But you still want to have certain. I don't want to say agendas, but certain points, certain focuses. With the, with the, just like you were mentioning about a lot of uh, the wrestling is in, improvised, uh, improvised and realizing what people are thinking about at that time and being able to go with it. Yeah. So this is what we want to do. We don't want to just, you know, crash and bad mouth and say everything stinks. So why aren't they doing this? They should listen to what they can. That's, to me, that's more. And, it's, and more importantly, it's been done. How do you do something in which every person knows, once again, the internet, just like when I uh, for my film festival, when digital filmmaking became a thing, I, the first thing I'd say at the beginning of every festival, the great thing about digital filmmaking is anyone can make a film. The bad thing about digital filmmaking is anybody, anybody can, can make, make a, a film. film. So it's, kind of, it's the kind of the same thing with podcasts. So I don't know how many wrestling podcasts there are. I imagine there's literally hundreds. Anybody who's ever watched wrestling, any minor character that at any time was in wrestling was saying, okay, this is what I can do now. I can do this. I can get on the air. I can get my opinions out there. I can make money off it, and, and I'm going to be hugely popular and a major entertainment you know, figure again. And that's all well and good, but what are they really offering? You know, I mean, and I'm not trying to bad my problem because I haven't listened to many, but I'm, I'm sure there's some good ones out there. But I think sure. what he can do would be completely different to that. I think he could add inside of the, like every aspect of the industry. I mean, from, how many people can say about the, the various highs that he's had in the industry and lows? How many people can then talk on a tangent about something that has nothing to do with it and keep the conversation interesting and surprise people? So this is kind of what the, the, um, I think the podcast is going to be, is having a fascinating human being who knows, now obviously the major crux of it is going to be professional wrestling, but it's not going to be limited to that, and it's, just, and it's not going to be a bad ass. I mean, because, uh, I mean, that's easy, right? It's easy to know to, to, to criticize and scream about anything or any imagined slight that you may have had with someone 30 years ago and say, oh, this person said this. I mean, who cares, right? Yeah. That, that's just not right. interesting. So this is, this is what we're, I'm, I think, what we're going to do. We have someone who can go beyond that and say a lot, can, can just talk on the subject of pro wrestling probably better than anyone else can or is willing to. Uh, so that's, that's what I think the Richie Circle is going to be. Right. I think that's about as good as it could be for it. Thank you very much, Billy. Yeah, and and what a beautiful what a beautiful concept to sit back, uh, talk about not only things that you're passionate about, but things that have happened to you in your life and why you're passionate about the things that you are. Uh, that's half the reason that this show started was because uh, people no longer sit, take the time to sit down and actively listen to each other, be willing to disagree, um, right. be be willing to have a hard conversation over a beer. You know, like our founding fathers used right. to. Those dudes shared property lines. That guy grew cotton. That dude, that dude grew crops. And whenever they needed each other's crops, they swapped crops. You know, 
despite right. what their political belief was. Uh, they took no, care uh, of each other. They possible? looked out for each other. Right. Are we talking about your show? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, and, no, that, I'm that, just saying because... Yeah. Uh, Internet has Internet got something to say. Hold on. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Internet, Internet just stop that. This is a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't this guy. He one spot. And he but, he's got stuff all over me now. That's crazy. <laughs> But it's it's just the fact of um, a lot of people have something to say. Not many people take the time to listen before they speak. And, right. And wow. I think the fact that that's, you're that trying to do that. That is probably the best I've ever heard this put. They don't think before they speak. And that's yeah. what we're really going to try to do. And I'm going to try really hard is to do that. You know, think before I say anything. And, and, you know, if I don't know it, say I don't know it. You know, don't yeah. pretend I do know something I don't know. You know, yeah. now I said, again, very clearly, I'm not afraid to ask questions, you know, because if anything, I want to know the truth about things. And now this is silly. Me and Barry talk about when he's really got me over the last year, really believing in climate change and not just him, my uncle as well. Um, but, you know, I do believe there was something wrong there. Um, do I know anything about it? No, but we do talk about things like that. Yeah. But no, uh, but no, the wrestling thing, this is going to be fun. Um, I don't, uh, I never want to get in a hurry. If you get ahead of yourself, you make mistakes. I don't want to do that either. We're going to, again, take our time. We're going to think these things out and just be sure we're trying to put our best foot forward. Absolutely. Well, as we wrap things up here, uh, number one, gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. I definitely want to have you guys back on as the show progresses, as right. things go on, have you on just to talk about things going on in society. What's happening yeah. in the world? Stuff like that. Sure. That's that's what we have to do, people. Um, now, hey, real quick, you, you got this show called Beard. Now, if you've seen the, and this is true stuff, have you ever seen the uh, the History Channel, the, the 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 show about the story about how Beard created everything? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, really, it was it was supposedly uh, responsible for the uh, first forms of agriculture and how they figured that out was. Okay, then went out there collect barley. It started raining. They they thinking that maybe they took off after something. Came back, found out they made alcohol. Then they started planting it. And that's planting those storm agriculture. Is also responsible for the very first first forms of writing and pyramids. If yep. you earn something, you you earn some bread and some beer. That's you right. Know, it was at the time. It was part of right. every worker's daily pay in ancient Egypt. And then also, you'll believe it's not as, as responsible for refrigeration. Uh, when they found out yep. cold filters, how good it was, they worked their butts off to f- come up with the first forms. That so, yeah. I was just seeing you know you got the beer show, you, you got the stories. So we there's, know you're in the up and up now. There's not a patron saint of brewers for nothing, my friend. Uh, it is there. It, you go, man. It it is from on high, most definitely. Um, and I have yet to find a culture around the world that did not consider it as such. Uh, be it there. You go. So. Um, once again, gentlemen, let everybody know, uh, when the podcast is dropping, you know, let, let them know so we can get a little bit of hype going for you guys and where the, where they're going to be able to find it. Well, that's the part we're still working on. Cause like Sid said, we're, okay. we're approaching it very, very slow. We're no, well, we're we're working we're on the last day, I've got actually a, a two producers coming from Canada to be here tomorrow. Ooh. We'll stay in the weekend with him. We're going to do the first four episodes. Uh, uh, this is to be able to get it launched off uh, 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 Labor Day. Uh, this is the first first okay. weekend. Uh, is it that's, Memorial that's Day? I, 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 I'm, I'm always hesitant to give a date. So we yeah, yeah, that yeah. Is the well, and I am too. And I am too because this is the thing is now. Steve Joyner is one. And I'm just saying what he has said about you know launching it off. You know, first of whatever of Labor Day. I'm like Barry. Even this guy gets here tomorrow. We spend the next few days of uh, meeting these people, yeah. a guy and a girl that both are producers. And if we, th- if I get what I think is good, we we'll, we might get it out. But if it's not, we're not going to do it. I'm not going to put out something. And this is the good thing about you know I've learned in wrestling that man, if I can redo something, I can pretty much make it close to perfect. So yeah. having him here and recording with everything, I think we, I, I think it's, it's safe to say we can't get it by then. But we're gonna. Barry and I, we're still doing the homework. Yeah. I want to see or listen to at least three, four, five more podcasts. Barry's going to do the same. Barry's got the idea for the, our, our theme music. 
and that's about as far as we've gotten. We don't have the first show we recorded, so do we get one? We're going to say as soon as we can, but I, well, go with Steve Jones, and we've been talking on these other podcasts. And again, I'm, I'm just—is uh, it Labor Day? Memorial the first. What's the next little holiday coming up? Labor Day. Next holiday will be Labor Day in September. Yep. Yeah, Labor Day. Okay, so it's supposed to be Labor Day weekend. And I think it's actually—I want to say a Sunday or something. I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, somewhere right in there is what we're shooting for. And, All right. And Steve has Barry. Steve has given a date on that. But like Barry said, and I said this in a, a couple podcasts prior to this one that I'm not. You know, I never get ahead of myself, so we're not going to. You know, we're, we're shooting for that, but if we don't make it, we, we, we'll just be. Uh, we're not going to make it. But I think we got a good chance of making that. Yeah, it seems like it. You guys definitely have the banter. Y'all have known each other long enough. Like I said, uh, you're obviously close enough that you literally complete each other's sentences and thoughts. Uh, well, I, I can't you, think. Dude, I can't think a, of a more natural transition to radio podcast well, format. And this is what also has helped me is um, just being on a good, you know, you were a good podcast, the guy from Poughkeepsie. Not that anyone wasn't a good podcast. Uh, with that guy, she called, we did, did a second one. Sure. It turned out the second one being really great. So getting these good ones under our belt is, you know, giving us momentum to really give okay. ourselves a really good chance to make ours pretty good, too. And it's just like I really enjoyed the beginning of yours, how you did yours, and where some I've seen where guys just start just going blah, 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 blah. I was thinking, wow, man, yeah. you had a really cool intro. Rebecca has a really cool intro. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure that – go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just thanking you. No, yeah, and that's, just, and that's what we want to ask you. Barry, what is the music you've come up with? Well, it's actually a, a song from a long time ago that I actually had on my radio show in 1992, and the reason why I picked it is because uh, the, the, the opening of it has a voice that says, you know, our time – is yours and i think that's a perfect intro for a podcast last you know, that's going to be interactive where people can call in because that's exactly what kid is doing his time is going to be there <laughs> he's giving, what was, giving what was your time. radio station about i forgot i, I remember that i would tell uh, oh, oh, okay. it, 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 it was a, it was a um you know for alternative music when that was just starting to break in 92 so once again, you and I talked a long time ago about music. How we like things that are that are future retro. It's like current, but it also so this this is from 27 years ago. The song, but it doesn't sound like anything today. It doesn't even sound like anything that came out then. So it doesn't right. have a time placement to it. So it's not going to sound dated. It's, 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 no one has heard it in a long time. It, it wasn't that huge to hit then. It's just it's always struck me. The first time I heard it 27 years ago, I said I, I filed it away. But at some point. I'm going to use this. I, I think it, it has to be used, you know, on air, probably radio. I mean, podcasts weren't, weren't a thing then, but I knew that's you know, over that type of airways. And I just think right. it's a perfect intro for, you know, for, for your podcast. Incredible. Right, so that's what you we're know, doing. Everyone will say. <laughs> and that's what we're doing, too, is we're really taking our time and doing, you know, Barry's probably got one of the answers. How many songs have you been player, Barry, you got? On your I mean, music what? library, how many songs oh, you have in the music library? Oh, songs. Well, let's see. I have, let's see, I have over a thousand, probably around seven thousand. Seven thousand. Nice. So well, he's he's sitting, and again having a radio station. That's why I want another music question. I call Barry. So I know I haven't heard this song, but we're gonna. I'm <laughs> sure it's gonna be great. So that's what we're doing. We even getting the songs down. You know, we want a cool intro like you had too. Oh, well, yeah, and, and that's just it. It does take some crafting to brand that stuff, to get it together, make sure that uh, you're using things properly, that, you're, that you've got good production going on. Uh, just, like, well, just like being in the ring, it's a show, and it's a show from the get-go. Um, and the bigger right. your personality, the bigger you splash, the more, the more you're going to be remembered. Um, so There you go. Uh, I think that was put really good. Thank you. Godspeed to you gentlemen and what you're doing with the Vicious Circle podcast. I cannot wait to have y'all back on to talk about it, stuff like that. Um, as we wrap up here, please do hold the line uh, so I can chat with y'all about everything else. But while you're online checking stuff out for Vicious Circle, everything else, make sure to stop on by the Dudes and Beer podcast. Dudesandbeer.com is where you can get all of the information. It's also where you can find our fantastic knowledge vault. If you're like me, you like 
just geeking out on stuff like the patents of Nikola Tesla, declassified government programs, documents, that kind of stuff. The whole treasure trove is there. Go check it out. Um, like designs from Bob Lazar, all kinds of stuff there. Um, while you're online checking that out, make sure to check out the great work of our parent network, the Universal Network. HC Universal Network. Also, make sure to stop on by DiamondCBD.com. Use the code DUDES420 to save 30% on your whole cart. Until next time, everybody, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and remember, if you can't be good, be good at it. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hold the line, guys. I'll be right back with you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. To listen to our audio streams or chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for Android and iDevices, available on Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Dudes and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.